Ninety one, on the lesson to be drawn from the burning of Lyon. Greetings from Seneca to his friend Lucilius. Our friend's liberalis is now downcast, for he has just heard of the fire which has wiped out the colony of Lugdunum. Such a calamity might upset any one at all, not to speak of a man who dearly loves his country. But this incident has served to make him inquire about the strength of his own character, which he has trained, I suppose, just to meet situations that he thought might cause him fear. I do not wonder, however, that he was free from apprehension touching an evil so unexpected and practically unheard of as this, since it is without precedent. For fire has damaged many a city, but has annihilated none. Even when fire has been hurled against the walls by the hand of a foe, the flame dies out in many places, and although continually renewed, rarely devours so wholly as to leave nothing for the sword. Even an earthquake has scarcely been so violent and destructive as to overthrow whole cities. Finally, no conflagration has ever before blazed forth so savagely in any town that nothing was left for a second. So many beautiful buildings, any single one of which would make a single town famous, were wrecked in one night. In time of such deep peace, an event has taken place worse than men can possibly fear even in time of war. Who can believe it? When weapons are everywhere at rest, and when peace prevails throughout the world, Lugdunum, the pride of Gaul, is missing. Fortune has usually allowed all men, when she has assailed them collectively, to have a foreboding of that which they were destined to suffer. Every great creation has had granted to it a period of reprieve before its fall. But in this case, only a single night elapsed between the city at its greatest and the city non existent. In short, it takes me longer to tell you it has perished than it took for the city to perish. All this has affected our friend Liberalis, bending his will, which is usually so steadfast and erect in the face of his own trials. And not without reason has he been shaken, for it is the unexpected that puts the heaviest load upon us. Strangeness adds to the weight of calamities, and every mortal feels the greater pain as a result of that which also brings surprise. Therefore, nothing ought to be unexpected by us. Our minds should be sent forward in advance to meet all problems, and we should consider not what is wont to happen, but what can happen. For what is there in existence that fortune, when she has so willed, does not drag down from the very height of its prosperity? And what is there that she does not more violently assail, the more brilliantly it shines? What is laborious or difficult for her? She does not always attack in one way, or even with her full strength. At one time she summons our own hands against us, at another time, content with her own powers, she makes use of no agent in devising perils for us. No time is exempt. In the midst of our very pleasures, there spring up causes of suffering. War arises in the midst of peace, and that which we depended upon for protection is transformed into a cause of fear. Friend becomes enemy, ally becomes foeman. The summer calm is stirred into sudden storms, wilder than the storms of winter. With no foe in sight, we are victims of such fates as foes inflict, and if other causes of disaster fail, excessive good fortune finds them for itself. The most temperate are assailed by illness, the strongest by wasting disease, the most innocent by chastisement, the most secluded by the noisy mob. Chance chooses some new weapon by which to bring her strength to bear against us, thinking we have forgotten her. Whatever structure has been reared by a long sequence of years, at the cost of great toil and through the great kindness of the gods, is scattered and dispersed by a single day. Nay, he who has said, a day, has granted too long a postponement to swift-coming misfortune, 
an hour, an instant of time suffices for the overthrow of empires. It would be some consolation for the feebleness of ourselves and our works if all things should perish as slowly as they come into being, but as it is, increases are of sluggish growth, but the way to ruin is rapid. Nothing, whether public or private, is stable. The destinies of men, no less than those of cities, are in a whirl. Amid the greatest calm, terror arises. And though no external agencies stir up commotion, yet evils burst forth from sources whence they were least expected. Thrones which have stood the shock of civil and foreign wars crash to the ground though no one sets them tottering. How few the states which have carried their good fortune through to the end. We should therefore reflect upon all contingencies, and should fortify our minds against the evils which may possibly come. Exile, the torture of disease, wars, shipwreck, we must think on these. Chance may tear you from your country or your country from you, or may banish you to the desert. This very place where throngs are stifling may become a desert. Let us place before our eyes in its entirety the nature of man's lot, and if we would not be overwhelmed or even dazed by those unwonted evils as if they were novel, let us summon to our minds beforehand not as great an evil as oftentimes happens, but the very greatest evil that possibly can happen. We must reflect upon fortune fully and completely. How often have cities in Asia, how often in Achaia, been laid low by a single shock of earthquake? How many towns in Syria, how many in Macedonia, have been swallowed up? How often has this kind of devastation laid Cyprus in ruins? How often has Paphos collapsed? Not infrequently are tidings brought to us of the utter destruction of entire cities. Yet how small a part of the world are we to whom such tidings often come? Let us rise, therefore, to confront the operations of fortune. And whatever happens, let us have the assurance that it is not so great as rumour advertises it to be. A rich city has been laid in ashes, the jewel of the provinces, counted as one of them and yet not included with them. Rich though it was, nevertheless it was set upon a single hill, and that not very large in extent. But of all those cities of whose magnificent and grandeur you hear today, the very traces will be blotted out by time. Do you not see how, in Achaia, the foundations of the most famous cities have already crumbled to nothing, so that no trace is left to show that they ever even existed? Not only does that which has been made with hands totter to the ground, not only is that which has been set in place by man's art and man's efforts overthrown by the passing days, nay, the peaks of mountains dissolve, Whole tracts have settled, and places which once stood far from the sight of the sea are now covered by the waves. The mighty power of fires has eaten away the hills through whose sides they used to glow, and has levelled to the ground peaks which were once most lofty, the sailor's solace and his beacon. The works of nature herself are harassed. Hence we ought to bear with untroubled minds the destruction of cities. They stand but to fall. This doom awaits them, one and all. It may be that some internal force and blasts of violence, which are tremendous because their way is blocked, will throw off the weight which holds them down, or that a whirlpool of raging currents, mightier because they are hidden in the bosom of the earth, will break through that which resists its power, or that the vehemence of flames will burst asunder the framework of the earth's crust, or that time, from which nothing is safe, will reduce them little by little, or that a pestilential climate will drive their inhabitants away and the mould will corrode their deserted walls. It would be tedious to recount all the ways by which fate may come, but this one thing I know. All the works of mortal man have been doomed to mortality, and in the midst of things which have been destined to die, we live. 
Hence it is thoughts like these and of this kind which I am offering as consolation to our friends Liberalis, who burns with a love for his country that is beyond belief. Perhaps its destruction has been brought about only that it may be raised up again to a better destiny. Oftentimes a reverse has but made room for more prosperous fortune. Many structures have fallen only to rise to a greater height. Timagenes, who had a grudge against Rome and her prosperity, used to say that the only reason he was grieved when conflagrations occurred in Rome was his knowledge that better buildings would arise than those which had gone down in the flames. And probably in this city of Lugdunum too, all its citizens will earnestly strive that everything shall be rebuilt better in size and security than what they have lost. May it be built to endure, and under happier auspices, for a longer existence. This is indeed but the hundredth year since the colony was founded, not the limit even of a man's lifetime. Led forth by Plancus, the natural advantages of its site have caused it to wax strong and reach the numbers which it contains today, and yet how many calamities of the greatest severity has it endured within the space of an old man's life? Therefore, let the mind be disciplined to understand and endure its own lot, and let it have the knowledge that there is nothing which fortune does not dare, that she has the same jurisdiction over empires as over emperors, the same power over cities as over the citizens who dwell therein. We must not cry out at any of these calamities. Into such a world have we entered, and under such laws do we live. If you like it, obey. If not, depart whithersoever you wish. Cry out in anger if any unfair measures are taken with reference to you individually, but if this inevitable law is binding upon the highest and the lowest alike, be reconciled to fate by which all things are dissolved. You should not estimate our worth by our funeral mounds or by these monuments of unequal size which line the road. Their ashes level all men. We are unequal at birth, but we are equal in death. What I say about cities, I say also about their inhabitants. Our dear was captured as well as Rome. The great founder of human law has not made distinctions between us on the basis of high lineage or of illustrious names, except while we live. When, however, we come to the end which awaits mortals, he says, Depart, ambition. To all creatures that burden the earth, let one and the same law apply. For enduring all things we are equal. No one is more frail than another, no one more certain of his own life on the morrow. Alexander, king of Macedon, began to study geometry. Unhappy man, because he would thereby learn how puny was that earth of which he had seized but a fraction. Unhappy man, I repeat, because he was bound to understand that he was bearing a false title. For who can be great in that which is puny? The lessons which were being taught him were intricate and could be learned only by assiduous application. They were not the kind to be comprehended by a madman who let his thoughts range beyond the ocean. Teach me something easy, he cries. But his teacher answers, these things are the same for all, as hard for one as for another. Imagine that nature is saying to us, those things of which you complain are the same for all. I cannot give anything easier to any man but whoever wishes will make things easier for himself. In what way? By equanimity. You must suffer pain, and thirst, and hunger, and old age too, if a longer stay among men shall be granted you. You must be sick, and you must suffer loss and death. Nevertheless, you should not believe those whose noisy clamour surrounds you. None of these things is an evil, None is beyond your power to bear or is burdensome. It is only by common opinion that there is anything formidable in them. Your fearing death is therefore like your fear of gossip. But what is more foolish than a man afraid of words? 
Our friend Demetrius is wont to put it cleverly when he says, For me to talk of ignorant men is like the rumblings which issue from the belly. For, he adds, what difference does it make to me whether such rumblings come from above or from below? What madness it is to be afraid of disrepute in the judgment of the disreputable. Just as you have had no cause for shrinking in terror from the talk of men, so you have no cause now to shrink from these things, which you would never fear had not their talk forced fear upon you. Does it do any harm to a good man to be besmirched by unjust gossip? Then let not this sort of thing damage death either in our estimation. Death also is in bad odour, but no one of those who malign death has made trial of it. Meanwhile, it is foolhardy to condemn that of which you are ignorant. This one thing, however, you do know, that death is helpful to many, that it sets many free from tortures, want, ailments, sufferings and weariness. We are in the power of nothing when once we have death in our own power. Farewell.